kids are heading off to Sunday school. I invite you all to get, get settled. And as we consider the, the coming king, the series we're looking at for these four Sundays of Advent, uh, we've been talking about the, the very interesting challenge of he, keeping Christ in Christmas. And, and I hope you're having some success at that. Uh, it is an ongoing battle, isn't it, in this culture? I, I thought it might be uh, interesting. Uh, Paul Cahigas, uh, some of you know, uh, a, a dear man of God who has time to look at, at the Internet a lot and sends uh, many stories. And uh, I have a chance to read some of them. And one of them he sent this week was so delightful, I thought I'd start with it because it actually ties in a bit with our, uh, the start of our message. And it comes out of a Mississippi farm county. A visiting pastor was there, and he was attending a men's breakfast. Now th picture this, Mississippi Farm County. He asked one of the impressive older farmers in attendance to say grace that morning. After all were seated, the older farmer began, Lord, I hate buttermilk. <laughs> the pastor opened one eye and wondered to himself where this was going. Then the farmer loudly proclaimed, Lord, I hate lard. Now the pastor was worried. However, without missing a beat, the farmer prayed on. And Lord, you know I don't care much about raw white flour. Just as the pastor was ready to stand up and stop everything, the farmer continued, But Lord, when you mix them all together and bake them up, I do love fresh biscuits. So Lord, when things come up we don't like, when life gets hard, when we just don't understand what you're saying to us, we just need to relax and wait till you're done mixing. Probably it'll be something even better than biscuits. Amen. Uh, many of us have been in the midst of things in life that we haven't especially uh, been happy about. Uh, Kelly and I had the privilege of taking the day on Thursday to drive around delivering poinsettias or chrismons to many of our shut-ins. Uh, by the time we were back, it took about seven hours, and we traveled 84 miles. <laughs> but we had a delightful time visiting uh, people who wish they were in different circumstances. Uh, as July this past month would say that, as as Lenny would say with his knee, and uh, you know, as the list goes on and on, isn't it? But when, when the Lord is done mixing, it can be quite beautiful. Now, I, I use that uh, image because today we add another understanding of Jesus to uh, that which we've already considered over the last couple weeks. Now, we started two weeks ago with uh, Jesus as the son of David, a huge and significant title of our Lord. And, and what we did was we walked through the reality of who David was and, and the symbol he is of a godly leader. Uh, and then the promise that he would build out of David's line uh, a, a coming king who would rule forever. And uh, so we're, we're talking about a, a human who will be the son of God, but uh, certainly a title of uh, extraordinary significance to call Jesus the son of David. We also consider there were times when, when people who needed healing or miracles, wonders, uh, God to touch them in life, just cried out, son of David, have mercy on me. That's a very significant celebration of what Christmas is about. But then last week we looked at Holy One, uh, obviously uh, embosomed in our stained glass windows, that the one who comes is holy, perfect, Pure, never makes mistakes. God. And that's why we sing about a holy night. And we sing about a holy city, Jerusalem. Because when he comes, everything becomes holy. And we are called to be holy, to be set apart, to be with him. That's the kind of God language. But now we're mixing something else into this. Uh, and that is that he comes to be Messiah. Now, Messiah is a very complex word, and I have certainly uh, found that it is a word that in our American culture, a lot of people have no clue what it even means. And what I, I find very sad is, even in church cultures, a lot of people don't know what Messiah means. I didn't appreciate that 20 years ago when we thought that was a great name for church. After all, we, we didn't just want to be uh, the, the next clever named church 
because of the sign of the compass or a particular road we were on. We didn't want to pick a name of a saint, though there are some great saints' names for churches. Uh, we wanted the name of the Lord himself, and we thought Messiah is unique and special and <laughs> certainly a significant name that I thought many people understood. After all, when Andrew first met Jesus, the day uh, around his baptism, and he went and got his, his brother Peter and said, we found the Messiah. This is a huge title for our Lord. And, and I thought that was a great name for a church. And, and I have to apologize to you. Maybe it's not. Because not only are we a, tuck, uh, a church that's tucked away behind, a, behind the main road now, and we weren't, but maybe we have a name that needs to be changed. And I'll, I'll name it first. Maybe we do. And maybe the new senior pastor needs to change the name so people will, will not put up a, a barrier right away to us. Because the name is unknown to so many. I've had people say, are you a messianic church? And I have to admit, I have to find out a little bit about the person, whether to say yes or no. Yes, we're a messianic church because we, we worship the Messiah, but we're not a messianic congregation if you mean all Jews who have come to accept the Messiah. So even that's confusing. But in fact, to proclaim Messiah is a collective term that has all sorts of connections to it. To claim one is Messiah is to first say anointed, the anointed one. Uh, it is also uh, equally translated as liberator, rescuer, redeemer, leader, healer, savior. All of that gets, get, is part of that collective uh, umbrella name of Messiah. It's a very significant name. But what's interesting in Hebrew scripture, that is in the Old Testament, Messiah was not necessarily connected to these. That is, God would send a Messiah, but the Messiah was not necessarily God. Do you hear what I'm saying? A very unique title. And in fact, in, in scripture, uh, in Isaiah, in fact, uh, the, the first one that's called the anointed, the Messiah, is Cyrus. He was a Persian ruler, wasn't even a Jew, and, and he was the one who let the Jews in captivity in Babylon go back to Jerusalem. So he was seen as their Messiah. Uh, it's only in, in later years that we began putting the Messiah together as not just a Messiah, as the Messiah. But let's recognize in human experience, we all need Messiahs often, don't we? People to heal us, deliver us, fix us, save us, help us. I mean, taking Jill to the, to the hospital. I had made her a few cups of tea and, you know, tried to comfort her, but that wasn't enough, apparently. Uh, we needed somebody to do something that we didn't understand. And, and, and same with so many of us. Uh, we, that is the human experience, isn't it? We need somebody to come along and, and do something we can't do ourselves. And at the time of Jesus' coming, there was a clear understanding that something's wrong with the world. Something's wrong with the culture. And anyone who's lived in the world more than a few years knows that, don't we? There's something wrong in the world. There's something wrong with our culture. There's something wrong with ourselves. And we need somebody to fix us. So let me walk you through a little scripture to help us to understand this, because for the first time, at least in the series, we're not looking about, uh, we're not considering someone who is unique, the son of David, the Holy One, which really has to do with being and identity. We're looking at what he does. That is doing versus being. Are you with me? For example, uh, I've had people say, Fred, what are you gonna do when, when you're no longer a senior pastor? And I, I said, well, the next thing the Lord wants me to, to do. But my being doesn't, my identity isn't to be a senior pastor, is it? Well, you could say that a little louder. <laughs> you, could, you could comfort me a little bit. <laughs> because all my identity is not wrapped up in my, my doing, it's in my being. I am a child of God. I am his servant. I'm trying to be. I am 
married to Jill. I am a father. Apparently, I am an elder in the church, whether I like it or not. <laughs> but what I do, well, that's up to the Lord. You see, we have celebrated that Jesus is the son of David. There's no question. Jesus is the Holy One. That was proclaimed right from the start. But what we celebrate in just a few days is that he, it's not just who he is. His identity is also what he is coming to do for us as the Messiah. You with me? So that's what we need to consider. What does scripture say about this? And, and how significant is this in the story of the birth? So turn with me, please, to... Well, let's start in a, a great American passage, Isaiah 33. Verse 22. And I think we've got this. Yes, we've got this on the screen. If Isaiah 33, 22. Uh, as, as Americans, we ought to know this one. And yeah, it's worth getting to. If you pull out your phone, this is one of those highlighted, the ones you need to highlight. Who has it highlighted? Or oh, you have your Bibles with you? You don't have your Bibles with you. Who's got their Bible with them? How many have this verse already highlighted? Okay, get out your pens. This is, oh, Charles does. Of course you would. <laughs> Great. I, huh? That's the new Bible. Okay, yes. I, I'm still breaking in mine. That's it. Here we go. Uh, oh, Jill's got it. All right. She's heard this before. I'm going to remind you, Isaiah 33, 22. I thought it'd be a great, fun place to start, especially as Americans, because in that day, the prophet spoke and said, the Lord is our judge. That's the judicial. The Lord is our lawgiver. That's the legislative. The Lord is our king. That's executive, because we don't like kings in America. Um, and and, and yeah, don't, not, Allison, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> Forgive me ahead of time. No. Um, this is where the founding fathers got the three uh, branches of our government. That, uh, and, and why do we need these three? Because through the three working together, it makes a great biscuit. What's the biscuit? He will save us. That's the biscuit. It, it's all about the Messiah. It's all about saving us. And, and we need systems, <coughs> excuse me, we need systems in our lives that not only judge us when we're wrong, give us laws so we learn how to live, but also who govern us so there can be an environment where the Lord can save us. That is some boundaries and stabilities. Uh, let me just, and it's not really meant to be a diversion, but just heard last night, our oldest son, um, Tim, and his wife, Maureen, got back a couple weeks ago from China. They were showing us fil the films last night. And he said the fascinating thing about China is uh, people almost understand it. But he said it's the most bizarre culture he's ever been introduced to. He said their tour guides were talking about how wonderful their government was. And he said he'd never heard anybody say that about our government. But, uh, and how everything was so great and they had so many freedoms. And he said everywhere they turned, they didn't have freedoms because the government told them to do anything and everything. And he said it was, it was bizarre at every level all the time. And, and he went on to admit it, it wasn't just the food. It wasn't just that they have beautiful things next to all the poverty and, and trash. He said it was just kind of strange. Uh, for me, it's trying to have a godly system without God. Trying to live in this world without the Messiah. Trying to live life without the church. Trying to celebrate Christmas without Christ. It doesn't make sense. <coughs> you see, it's all about the fact that there are many times in life we need somebody to save us. That's the human condition. We may not like it. And we can believe the lies to say, oh, I can handle it. And then we quickly find ourselves in situations that we can't. We need somebody to do things that we can't do. That's the work of the Messiah, the healer, the liberator, the redeemer, the savior, the deliverer, the teacher. Well, let, let's just move on from Isaiah 33, just jump to one of the messianic chapters, uh, Isaiah 35. Delightful celebration of what happens when Messiah comes. 
Uh, Isaiah 35 starts, the wilderness and the dry ground shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. Do you hear the language? Beautiful poetic language that where there was no life, there's life. Where there was no hope, there's hope. Where there's no joy, it's bursting into life and celebration. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The majesty of Carmel and Sharon. These are beautiful places you'd want to go on vacation and stay. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands. Make firm the feeble knees. <laughs> Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong. Fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, he will come and what? Save you. That's the language of a Messiah. That's the language of a Savior who's going to get you out of the muck that you're in, get you out of the mud you're walking through or that's starting to get up to your nose. He's going to save us. Jump down to verse 10. The ransomed of the Lord shall return. They'll come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Do you see the early condition is sorrow and sighing? We all know that in the human life, don't we? There are many times when we find ourselves in places we don't want to be, and it's filled with sorrow and sighing. But the, the understanding of faith is, but Messiah comes, and then there's gladness and joy. You see, singing and joy, celebrating is part of journeying with the Messiah because he, we're letting him work in our lives. It's also part of being in a place of sighing and sorrow, isn't it? if we really know that there is Messiah. If you have no hope, well. But if you know there's one who can help, it changes everything. Let me just give you an example. I got a call uh, at the church phone, and, and none of you use the church phone, so I know it's not one of you. But I had a call on my church phone. Uh, <laughs> And I remember that it was over there next to the window. I saw this little be beeping uh, number. Uh, and uh, so I listened to it. It was a woman saying, do, do we, do we, as a church, do we offer help at Christmas? And yeah, okay, the first time my heart sinks and goes, I just wanted it. But okay, so I, I called her, and it sounded like a genuine need. Wanted some, some financial help, wanted some Christmas help. And I said, well, I'm connected with a few different folks. We're packaging food boxes tomorrow. Would you like a food box? Well, I don't know. And I said, well, what do you need? And she mentioned a few things. I said, well, I can refer you to this for this and this. For, I'll give you a number. You can say that Fred suggested you call. And I was trying to arrange that. And, I, and then she texted me back and said, you know, I really would love one of those food bag, uh, boxes. So OK. So a few of us went over to help at Serve and package fresh vegetables and fruits yesterday uh, for the 350 in our county that have been identified as needing some assistance. It was a very humbling experience. Um, but then, uh, before we got there, she had texted later in the day yes, uh, on Friday and said, any chance you could bring some toilet paper? Thinking, okay, this is a real need. I've been in ministry a long time. I've never had anybody ask me for that. So this is not a faker. When you're asking someone who's going to come and help you, you see, she needed hope. I answered the phone and called her back. So now she has hope to think there might be some other possibilities. So sure enough, Ray uh, told, told us what the address was. Charles and I went over there after, after the work yesterday and, and took the, the food box, which was an amazing box of vegetables and fruits that we can't get in Kroger and Publix. It was right off the shipping trucks. Beautiful, beautiful fruit and vegetables. Um, and she made some comments about not seeing fruit like that before. Uh, but they had already set apart on their porch, things they wanted us to take to Goodwill. You see, they don't have a vehicle. And he's not allowed to drive yet because of his health. They weren't desperate. They had a clean house. He had a job. He rode his bike to work. M my point in telling you the story is that, that she found someone who could step into her life and provide her some hope. And she began dreaming that she could get not only fruit, but, but even toilet paper. And I said, before we left, I said, can we pray with you? And they said, absolutely. So we prayed with them. Offered them our church to be their home if they want a church home. But then I said, anything else? And they said, that, well, we'd love some help with the utility bill. So we took that and said, I, I, what I, this is the way I put it. I said, do you trust me? 
She said, yes. She and her husband said, yes, we do. I said, okay, give me the bill. I'll make sure it's paid. You see, once we have the hope of believing that there is someone who will, who will help us, then it opens up all sorts of possibilities. And then she started to cry tears of joy. You see, without that, without the knowledge of Messiah, it's just some religious gobbledygook. But when someone comes alongside and embodies it, even for a moment, we begin to dream, don't we? We begin to risk joy and hope. Folks, this is really important for us to embrace. We are not just celebrating this birth of 2,000 years ago. We're celebrating the reality that Messiah comes and he invites us to pick up our cross and journey with him. And that's extraordinary. What a privilege we have. But turn with me to the more famous uh, verses, uh, Messianic verses. Go to Isaiah 61. And I'm just saying in Isaiah because it's easy for y'all. We could bounce all over the Old Testament, but um, because it's everywhere. The need for a savior, the need for a redeemer, the need for a healer, it's everywhere in scripture. But Isaiah 61 is, is obviously one that Jesus quotes himself. Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. That directly translates as he has made me the Messiah. To bring good news to the poor, he sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn, to give them uh, a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness. Wow. Jump down to verse 7. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. Verse 10, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. Do you hear how it works? We, we risk believing there is one who has an answer for us. And we discover hope. And singing. And celebration become part of our lives, maybe for the first time. And often, we have to experience it through someone else first until we can experience it from the Lord himself. But there's this longing in all of us that there's someone who's going to be there when we need a Savior, the Christ, the Messiah. Turn with me, please, to Luke uh, maybe a good place to show you in the Gospels uh, some of the places where this plays itself out. Especially, uh, well, we'll get to it in this time of year. But go with me to, uh, to Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. This is the first day of Jesus' ministry in uh, the synagogue at Nazareth. And he says, quoting Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He's saying, I have come to be Messiah. And that's why when they heard this, they wanted to kill him. At least the religious leaders who didn't want the status quo changed. And think about it. Faith is always the challenge to give up our status quo. It isn't change for change's sake. It's change for God's sake. And it's change for our sake because we need to give up our preconceived notions about what it is to be a believer, what it is to be a follower of Christ, who Christ even is. He is not just coming to give us an excuse to have a party uh, next Tuesday or Wednesday. He is coming to be Messiah. And that's what he proves in his life. It's very interesting. Go back now to Luke chapter 1. Part of the Christmas story is, is obviously the, the coming of John the Baptist first. And his father, who was silenced, the priest who didn't believe that Messiah was coming. And Zechariah is finally able to speak after John the Baptist is birthed. And uh, down at verse 68, he breaks into Zechariah's prophecy. 
And he proclaims, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. He is saying before it happens that he has come to believe now that his son, John the Baptist, is going to foretell the reality. And the reality is one is coming to save us. One is coming to pull us out of the muck. One is coming to forgive us, to cleanse us, to heal us, to lead us, to guide us. And that's one of the probably six most famous prophecies in, in, the, in the New Testament. He says, this is what we're celebrating in the birth of my son, God's sending Messiah. Woo. Chapter 2. We'll be reading this, obviously, in a few days. Verse 10. The angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For to you is born this day in the city of, uh, of David a what? A Savior who is Christ, or in the Hebrew, who is Messiah, the Lord. See, that's what the angel is proclaiming to the, the shepherds, that Messiah has come. It's time to celebrate. Now there's a reason for hope in our lives. You see, w when we choose to not have hope in our lives, we've just given up our faith. We've just said... God, you can't work here. And the proof is he comes for us. And that's why the language is so popular at the time of Christ Christmas. Have you made room in your heart for him? Because if we walk in that hope, we change people's lives. We change people's lives. That's what it is to celebrate the Messiah. I could go on and on because it's, it, it is the message of the scripture. It is the message of this church. It is the message of our lives. And I'm just reminding y'all, that's why we celebrate Christmas. Because you see, listen to this one, because I didn't understand this until the Lord gave me this wording this past Friday morning. Christmas without Christ is Christmas without the cross. And that is... It's a scandal. Yes, it's that important. Christmas without Christ is a Christmas without the cross. And I was so surprised the word scandal came that I actually looked up the word scandal to make sure I understood what, what the Lord was telling us. It's wrongdoing. It's immoral. It's outrageous. It's shameful. It's a disgrace. And it is a great offense to God. He sends his son to be our Messiah. And what does that mean? He goes to the cross for us. And what he reminded me early this morning when I came in here, isn't it interesting we have the cross above the stable? And isn't it interesting that anybody who comes here to celebrate communion has the shadow of the cross on him or her? Just interesting. That we don't have communion without the shadow of the cross. We can't celebrate Christmas without the shadow of the cross. And anyone who says, don't talk to me about that kind of stuff. I just want to celebrate the birth of a baby. Hasn't got a clue. And that's a scandal. So what's our response during this time? We choose to not be afraid of whatever we're facing. Whether it's a, a physical challenge whether it's a financial challenge. Oh my, there's a lot of zeros before the decimal point in bills we're now seeing. Fear not. Oh, we have a new pastor search underway. Fear not. Oh, I don't know if I'm going to get that new job. Fear not. Don't know if the college will accept me. Fear not. We live without fear because we have someone who's journeying with us and has come to prove it. What's the other response? Joy. Celebrate. That's why we sing all these songs. That's why we sing praises. It's not just to, to feel good about old songs. It's to celebrate Messiah has come. We walk in faith. We walk with Messiah. And we all need one, don't we? 
And if, if we ever doubt whether we need Messiah to come, wait till tomorrow or the day after. It'll become very clear, won't it? Oh, God, help me. And that's crying out for Messiah in all the ways he comes to help us. Do you see how exciting this is to share with our family and friends? How exciting it is to have a Christmas celebration that has meaning and purpose, not about what's under the tree, not about the decorations and the great food or those amazing cookies. Not about that, <laughs> although it's really nice. Really nice. Far more profound. The son of David, the Holy One, is also our Messiah. What a beautiful recipe God's working. You wait till next week. Amen? That's why we're here. That's why we're Church of the Messiah. We may need to change the name, not for our sake, but for the world, so they understand who we are. But once we're walking with Messiah, it isn't just what we do, is it? It is who we are. It is who we are. We're the ones who, have, who follow the Christ. Thoughts, questions? Did you hear God? Yeah. When you're saying we should change the name to the world, I think it's up to us to change the world. <laughs> I don't think, you know, I think by saying what you said, you know, um, it's like that's what's going on in our country now. Just change everything. Let's do away with history. And the other thing is, I've been hearing a lot about the, we need to put Jesus back in Christmas. Well, have you, has anybody talked to anybody and said Merry Christmas and somebody told them back, hey, I'm offended that you said that? Mm -hmm. Where does this no. all come from? Not only Satan. It's only Satan. Yeah, as I, as I shared last week, if somebody says Happy Holidays, uh, come right back to them and say, thank you, because that word comes back from the 12th century uh, English, which means have a great holy day. <laughs> and thank you. I, we hope to do that. Just that. Would you like to join us? <laughs> yeah, can even more. Yeah, that's right. So, thank you. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It, it, it's hard in a culture that doesn't want to honor Christ, but it doesn't mean we can't, and it doesn't mean we can't show them in the love of even handing out food boxes or covering a utility bill that we're just part of what God is doing. One of the things I found myself saying there with Charles yesterday, I guess he kept me honest, uh, standing there as we are. Uh, I said, I, I said, please understand. We're not here to give you a, a, a handout. We're here just helping you up. Uh, we got help just this week, my wife and I, and, and we just wanna, wanna share that. We're, we're just all in this together, aren't we? It's nobody's that figured it out and is all set and is above all this stuff. It's just life. But it's life with the Messiah, with the Christ. It's extraordinary. It's a great way to live. And no, I don't understand how people live this life without him. And I wish everyone I meet would know the joy that we are going to be having in our celebrations. And hopefully the joy you've got in your heart right now. This music team, they're going to be back here next Sunday. They're going to be here even Christmas Eve, 4 o'clock. Well, as long as people don't choose other priorities. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> We always have other things, but it's wonderful. Let's pray. <laughs> Lord, pray for Matt that he would know. That <laughs> no, we wouldn't do that, Lord. We wouldn't do that. Lord, when you bring all the pieces together, you do make a beautiful, beautiful gift of grace, far better than biscuits. We're grateful for that. And Lord, for those of us who have been away, or for those of us who have been here all the time, Lord, just keep reminding us again that you come for us. You come to make all things new. We ask that you would help us to live lives where there is no fear and no anxiety, where we really are walking out joy because we're walking out our lives with you. We pray for those who are traveling. Members of this community, Lord, like Steve and Stella returning today, uh, Tom Bills, away, others who are traveling. Uh, Father, we, we pray for those who would want to be here with us but can't, for Chuck and Ann, who are looking forward to being with us on Christmas Eve, uh, for Chris, 
for Mike and Becky, for Ruby. We pray for each of us, Lord, that you would have in our hearts that which is an open place for you to dwell, for you to give us hearts of gratitude and joy. Lord, bless Pat with healing. Bless Kelly as she's away. For Emily for healing. And Lenny. And Lord, we, we do thank you for the rain, but we're, we're ready to have it go away so we can have the lights of hope. We ask your blessing on this community, Lord, as we uh, seek a, a new senior pastor. Pray your blessing for our teenagers as we uh, are looking for the rebirth of a new program for our teens. And Lord, in and through all things, Pray for the grace of your Holy Spirit. Thank you that we can live under the shadow of the cross. Thank you that we celebrate Christmas. Christmas.